This part of my talk is titled Root Canals, or maybe you don't want a mummy in your head. So what is it about root canals that's so good or so bad? And why does a dentist do a root canal to begin with? Well, to understand that, you have to understand a little bit about how the body functions and how our body is designed to fight infection. Our body is a very dynamic thing. There are parts of the body where the cells move very quickly. There are parts of the body where the cells move slowly. Teeth have a circulation inside of them that moves very slowly. In fact, it's probably one of the slowest parts of the whole body. And that is why when you have a cavity in a tooth, it doesn't heal in two or three days, it may not heal in a month. In fact, most cavities never heal at all. Why is that? Well, because the circulation is so slow inside the tooth. In fact, there are some parts of the tooth that are so small that the white blood cells cannot get in there to fight the bacteria. God designed teeth differently than he did the rest of the body. Any place else in the body, if you get a cut or an injury, somebody punches you in the arm, first thing that's going to happen is you're going to bleed a little bit. Then after the bleeding, you're going to have a little bit of inflammation, maybe even a little bit of pain. But then you have wonderful cells in the body that will come, eat up the bad parts, get rid of the dead parts, clean house basically, and then after they're finished cleaning house, you have other cells in the body that will come and lay down new tissue. That whole process doesn't happen as readily when it comes to teeth. Maybe God intended for us to stay in the garden and eat nothing but fruits and vegetables off the branches. I think if we had that done, eh, maybe we wouldn't be getting the decay rate that we have today. So things move a lot slower inside teeth. There is a teeny bit of repair work done, but not very much. So what happens when you get a cavity? Well, you have bacteria all around the outside surface of the tooth. Now our teeth were designed to be naturally cleansing. Fluid flows from the inside of the tooth to the outside of the tooth. Just like your skin. If you're sitting in a relatively cool room, you don't feel perspiration. You don't feel that there's moisture on the outside of the skin. You actually don't even know that there's fluid going from the inside of your body to the outside of the body. Now, yeah, you'll feel it on a hot summer day, but you don't feel it in December, but it is happening. It's taking place. Same thing with our teeth. Fluid flows from the inside of the tooth to the outside of the tooth. And as it does this, it cleanses the tooth and washes away a lot of the bacteria that are on the surface of the teeth. Well, when your body chemistry changes, and I don't mean for in a good way, I mean when your body chemistry changes in a bad way. You've eaten a lot of sh sugar, you've eaten a lot of refined processed foods, your phosphorus level drops. When the phosphorus level in the body drops below 3.4, then that fluid flow from the inside of the tooth to the outside of the tooth stops. Now the direction of fluid is in the reverse, from the outside to the inside. And with it goes the bacteria that are sitting on the surface of the tooth. That's how you get decay. Decay is a systemic disease. It doesn't come from not brushing your teeth too much. It doesn't come from, well, indirectly, it does come from having too much sugar in the diet, but not sugar directly. Okay. Decay comes because the body chemistry has changed and fluid is now flowing from the outside to the inside of the tooth. The tooth then demineralizes and we wind up having bacteria inside the tooth. Now, there was a scientist and a dentist by the name of Dr. Weston Price. Dr. Weston Price was brilliant. He was a man who was probably a hundred years ahead of his time. Dr. Weston Price did microscopic studies before most scientists even owned a microscope. He was doing microscopic studies. And he showed that if decay was halfway the distance from the enamel to the pulp, halfway the distance, that that pulp was already infected with bacteria. Well, that's interesting. So let's see. We've got enamel on the outside of the tooth. 
Then the next layer of the tooth is called the dentin. The dentin is not as uh, crystallized as the enamel. It's a little bit softer material. And then under the dentin you have the pulp. The pulp is where all the blood vessels and lymphatics and, and mostly, mostly nerves, most of the nerves in the tooth are in, in the pulp. So you've got three layers. You've got enamel, you've got dentin, you've got pulp. And Weston Price says halfway from the enamel to the pulp. Well, that's very interesting. That's right about where the enamel ends and the dentin begins. It's interesting because that's the point at which I was taught in dental school that the dentist could call that a cavity. That's also the point at which the dentist would see the cavity on an x-ray. Well, if that's the point that the dentist sees the cavity on the x-ray and says, yes, in fact, you have a cavity, that pulp is already infected. Once the pulp is infected, irreversible damage has occurred. Is the tooth going to die within 24 hours? No. Is the tooth going to die in maybe a few weeks? No. But the body is going to have a very difficult time getting rid of the bacteria in that pulp. And if given an opportunity, because the body chemistry is not where it should be, because the diet is not where it should be, given enough time, those bacteria inside the pulp will continue to multiply until the tooth dies. Very interesting. Again, when the bacteria is halfway the distance from the enamel to the pulp, which is right at the dentin, that pulp is already infected. So what should we do? Should we just take out all teeth that have cavities? I don't think so. I don't think most people would like to lose all of their teeth at such an early age. Most of us like to keep on to our teeth as long as we possibly can. But it certainly brings home to us the message that not getting a cavity is the best way to go. Staying with a healthy diet that keeps you from having your phosphorus level drop below 3.4 is the best way to go. Once that cavity forms, yes, a dentist can go in there very conservatively, remove the part of the enamel and remove the part of the dentin that is affected, and the dentist can put in a beautiful filling, and that will give you some more time with that tooth. But it was certainly the best thing to do is to not get the cavity to begin with. How did we wind up going from talking about root canals to talking about decay? Well, suppose you don't go to the dentist. Suppose you do have a cavity that starts out in the enamel, reaches the dentin, it's not going to be seen by a dentist because you didn't go to the dentist, and now the pulp is infected. Once that pulp gets infected, there is no room for inflammation. There is no room. Remember we talked about before that if you were to get cut or somebody was to punch you in the arm, the first thing that would happen is you would have some inflammation. You would have some pain. You would have some swelling. Well, there's not a lot of room inside the tooth for inflammation and for swelling. So once that happens, usually the, the nerve fibers that are inside the pulp wind up getting strangulated and they wind up dying or they become necrotic. Now you've got a serious problem. Now the tooth can never be repaired, can never re go reverse back to its healthy state with a perfect pulp, perfect dentin, and perfect enamel. It just doesn't happen. So the dentist at that point, when you, when you get to the point where you start having pain in the tooth and you do go to the dentist, the dentist would look at that and say you have a cavity that is very large and it is into the pulp of the tooth. At that point, the dentist would most likely recommend that you either have a root canal done, root canal treatment, or you have the tooth extracted and possibly have an implant placed in its place. So just what is a root canal? Well, now the dentist has to get into that pulp, remove all of the tissue that's infected. How do they do that? Well, they drill a hole right through the top of the tooth make that hole large enough so that they can get into the pulp and start to mechanically remove all of that infected pulp tissue. In fact, they actually take those instruments and go all the way down the root, which is where it gets its name, root canal therapy. They go all the way down to the bottom of the root, remove the nerves, remove the blood vessels, remove whatever lymphatics are in there, 
and hopefully during the same process also remove the bacteria. Dentists use lots of different chemicals. Hypochlorate solution is one of them. Hypo meaning less than, chlorate, chlorine. Um, some of you know what Clorox is, right? Those are the solutions that they use to wash the inside of the canal. Um, some dentists actually will use ozone, a um, mixture of ozone and water. That also kills bacteria. It's all kinds of medicinal medicines and chemicals that they can use to clean out the inside of the canal. In the process of doing this, they're cleaning the main trunk of the tooth and maybe even cleaning the walls of that main trunk. They can't do much for the millions and billions of little lateral tubes that run off the side of that main canal. I like to use the analogy sometimes that doing a root canal is like cleaning the trunk of a tree. Yeah, you could probably get inside the trunk of a tree and you could probably rotor rooter the whole inside of the trunk if it was a strong tree and maybe even leave the outside bark. You would never be able to clean every branch of that tree. You would never be able to clean every twig of that tree and go all the way out to the leaves. I don't think so. That's exactly what the inside of the tooth is like. It's kind of like clean, trying to clean the inside of a tree and at the same time keep the tree intact. Not an easy challenge. Not an easy one at all. In fact, there's a book called Root Canal Cover-Up. This book was written by Dr. George Meinig. Dr. George Meinig was one of the founders of the American Endodontic Society. The American Endodontic Society is a group of specialists. These are dentists who specialize in doing root canals. He was one of the founders, I'll say it again, he was one of the founders of the American Endodontic Society. When he discovered the work of Weston Price and realized that necrotic tissue is not a good thing to keep in the human body, he decided to write this book, let people know about it, and tell people that maybe having a root canal is not such a good idea. By the way, everybody should read this book. On page 175, he has here two pictures of the inside of a tooth. The inside of a tooth looks more like a sponge. At the microscopic level, it looks more like a sponge. There are millions and billions of tubes running in every direction. Each one of these tubes varies in size. The smallest ones can be a half micron wide. Half micron wide is very small. I mean, you can't even see a half micron with the naked eye. And yet in this picture on the left side, you see a circle that's a half micron wide, and in the center of the circle, with plenty of room to stretch out his legs, is a bacteria. Some of these circles can have two or three bacteria in them. This is what the inside of the tooth looks like. It's actually a sponge. It's a sponge with billions of tubules going in every direction. With, If it's a root canal tooth, there's plenty of bacteria living in there. The bacteria actually get to eat the food that you eat. How's that? If there's no circulation, how, do they, how does the food get in there? Well, for an example, it's Friday night. Most people on Friday night in the United States have, have pizza. It's Friday night is pizza night. So what's pizza made up of? Well, let's see. You've got uh, the bread, which is carbohydrate. You've got the mozzarella cheese, plenty of fat in that, right? Oh, by the way, there's actually protein also. So you've got the three essential foods that we eat, fat, protein, and carbohydrates. The pizza goes into your stomach. You digest the pizza. You've got fat, protein, and carbohydrates floating around in your bloodstream. When the concentration gets high enough in the bloodstream, it can actually flow into the tooth via a process called osmosis. Osmosis says things can go from high concentration to low concentration, without any transport mechanism. So the, so the bacteria inside the pulp actually get fed. Every Friday night you have pizza, they have pizza. Then the bacteria do the exact same thing that you and I would do. After a couple of slices of pizza and maybe a beer, I'm going to have to go to the bathroom. The bacteria do the same thing. 
Oh, yeah. In the scientific world, we have a fancy name for it. We call them toxins. It's basically bacteria, piss, and poop. It's the bacteria, piss, and poop that make us sick. It's not the yeast that give you trouble in your body when you have a yeast infection. It's the yeast, piss, and poop that make us sick. So it's the bacterial piss and poop that, that when it reaches a high enough concentration inside the tooth, it also leaves the tooth via osmosis into the blood circulation, and that's what makes us sick. So you've given these bacteria now, in a root canal tooth, you've given these bacteria free housing, free food, and no means of getting destroyed by white blood cells because a white blood cell can't fit into a hole that's only a half micron wide. Your average white blood cell is about 8 to 10 microns wide. They're pretty big characters in this, in this microscopic world of, of body anatomy. They're pretty big. Half micron wide is a tube that's just a little too small for them to get into, so they can never get to those bacteria. The bacteria continue to multiply, they continue to eat, they continue to metabolize, they continue to piss and poop, they continue to produce toxins. So the older the root canal is, the higher the amount of toxins within that root canal. Well, what about the chemicals that the dentist uses to clean out the canal? Don't they kill all the bacteria? I wish, I wish they did, but they don't. Those chemicals are very good at cleaning out the main canal. But when it gets down to the dentinal tubules all the way at the end of the tooth, nothing happens. Well, maybe that's not completely true. It would actually be better if nothing happened. After the dentist has finished cleaning out the canal, the dentist then seals the canal up. Once the canal is sealed, there's no means for air to get down into the canal. This is a new root canal. There's no means for air to get down in there. And so these bacteria that were there, that at one time were aerobic bacteria, aerobic is another fancy scientific term meaning air-breathing bacteria. Once that canal is sealed off, the bacteria no longer get any air. They're no longer getting any oxygen. You would think that would kill them, but it doesn't. Bacteria are strong characters. They just change their form. They undergo something called pleomorphism. They change their form, and they become anaerobic bacteria. Anaerobic bacteria don't need any air. Problem with that is the anaerobic bacteria are much more toxic. In other words, remember we're talking about their piss and poop? Their piss and poop is a lot more toxic than the aerobic bacteria. Who are these guys? Well, anaerobic bacteria are E. coli, botuli, things like that. We all know those names. We all know that if you have an E. coli infection, you're in serious trouble. So the dentist can sterilize the inside main canal, can do nothing for the little teeny little microscopic canals in the end, and that's where the bacteria grow. He has now, he or she has sealed off the end of the tooth. You now have aerobic bacteria becoming anaerobic bacteria. They're producing toxins. Those toxins, when you get to a certain level, will start to seep out of the tooth, and your body becomes aware of the fact that you have a very serious infection up in your mouth. Well, the body is programmed to send white blood cells to take care of infections. It does that all the time. But the white blood cells can't get into the infection. Yeah, they'll get as close as they possibly can get, but they can't get inside the tooth. And so the average white blood cell lives seven days. After seven days, those cells die. Some more white blood cells come. They hang around the tooth seven days. They die. Some more white blood cells come. And week after week after week, your body is sending white blood cells to fight an infection to get rid of a tooth that it can never get rid of. Now, it's a free country. You can use your white blood cells for whatever you want to use them for. I just as soon save my white blood cells for something important. Cancer. Hepatitis C. Who knows? Who knows what's going to come down the pike? I want to have the strongest white, white blood cells I can have. I don't want to waste any of my blood cells finding a root canal tooth, an infection that I created, that my dentist created with me, that I can never win. 
Suppose you get into an elevator. Some gentleman gets in behind you, and he sneezes. Hachoo! He has hepatitis C. Now you've got hepatitis C viruses floating around the elevator. Some of them are going to get into your lungs. All right? They get into your lungs. You have white blood cells inside your lungs that are specifically hiding in the tissue, waiting for just this kind of an event. The signal gets sent to the brain. Hepatitis C, hepatitis C in the right bronchi. The president of the brain, who's the head boss, he sends a message to the president of Spleen University and says, we need 50,000 white blood cells on the double, right bronchi, hepatitis C. And the president of Spleen University says, excuse me, sir, we don't have 50,000 white blood cells. Do you remember that root canal that we've been fighting in the mouth for the last 10 years? They have been draining us. We do not have the white blood cells that you need to fight hepatitis C. Suppose I send you 10,000 and maybe another 20 or 30 immature cells. Would that do? Body's not going to be happy with the situation. But it's a situation that could have been avoided had you not kept a dead, necrotic, infected root canal tooth in your head. It's a free country. You can do with what you like with your white blood cells in your mouth, but you should be informed before you choose to have a root canal tooth. Most dentists are very good at filling and cleaning the inside of a root canal tooth. What do they fill it with? They fill it with a material called gutta percha most of the time. Gutta percha is a rubbery material that comes off a tree from South America. Gutta percha in and of itself is not so bad. It's the cements that they mix gutta percha with that have caustic chemicals in it, things like phenol and formaldehyde, and all kinds of things that are not necessarily good for the body. That's what makes the root canal also toxic. Some of that gutta percha, some of that cement, actually gets past the end of the root canal and enters into the body. And um, not, not a good thing to have. Now, there are some dentists, call themselves even biological dentists, they say that you can do a root canal by pushing ozone, ozone gas down into the canal. Well, when I first heard about this, I, th I was excited. I thought, wow, this is great. Ozone is biological. Ozone gets converted into oxygen. Bacteria, most bad bacteria don't like oxygen. This is going to be a wonderful thing. Well, yeah, you could sterilize the inside of a tooth with ozone gas. And you could actually keep it sterile for, oh, maybe 34 seconds, maybe a minute. You certainly can't keep it sterile forever, and you certainly can't keep it sterile after the tooth is sealed. Because when the tooth is sealed, it never stays sealed. So yes, you can have an ozone root canal, but don't think for one moment that that tooth is going to stay sterile. The bacteria will still move in. As soon as you start to chew on that tooth, whatever the dentist sealed it with will open up on the sides, and when it opens up on the side, the bacteria will go marching down into this free condominium, ten abreast, and they will set up housekeeping. It may take them a few months, may even take them a year. By the time their population gets high enough, you will have the same amount of toxins in your bloodstream as a person who had a gutter percha cement field root canal. There are also some biological dentists that think that you can laser the inside of a root canal and sterilize it. Well, I, I thought that was exciting too. As a matter of fact, I love lasers. I use them in my practice. Lasers only head in one straight line. There's no such thing as a laser beam that can make a left turn or a right turn. Well, you remember the picture that I showed you about all the dentinal tubules, how they make left turns, right turns, go off at 45 degrees. There are billions of these tubules. There is no such thing as a laser beam that can turn and twist and sterilize each one of those tubules. And even if it could, if it could sterilize those tubules, just like ozone gas does, again, it would stay sterile for about 34 seconds, maybe a minute. Okay, maybe two minutes. But then you've got empty space in the body. Somebody is going to move in. 
It's a free condominium. You've got a free space for housing. You've got free food. And no white blood cells can get in to clean you out. Every creepy little bacteria in the body that can get into that tooth will. They will set up housekeeping, they will multiply, and you will have a chronic infection in that tooth. Suppose you do have a root canal. Suppose you have several root canals. What should you do about it? That's a difficult question to answer. And each one of you are going to have to answer that question yourself because only you know how healthy you are, how terrific you feel when you get up in the morning, each person has to answer that question themselves. You can have the help of a dentist. If the dentist knows how to read an x-ray, it would be even better if the dentist knew something about energy fields in the body and would know whether or not it was affecting your energy levels. It's a difficult question to answer. What do you do if you already have one or several root canals in your head? If you decide to have the root canals extracted, it's very important that it be done just the right way. And how is that? Well, the right way to take out a root canal tooth is very thoroughly. You can't just have the tooth extracted the way a dentist would extract any tooth. After the tooth is extracted, you must make sure that all of the ligament that held onto this tooth is removed because that tooth is also infected. You must make sure that the space between the ligaments and the bone is thoroughly cleaned out. You must make sure that if there's any root canal filling material beyond the tooth still sitting up in the bone, that has to be removed. Every part of the tissue that was related to this root canal tooth must be thoroughly moved away. Now, if that's done, you're going to have a tremendous amount of bacteria introduced into the bloodstream as that tooth is being rocked and shaken and, well, most people use the, the expression yanked out. As a dentist, uh, I resent that term. I don't think I've ever yanked out a tooth. What we do is we, we take it out. We kind of encourage the tooth to come out on its own. Um, if, if you're having that done, it's a good idea to have IV vitamin C flowing through your bloodstream. That's going to reduce the effects of the bacteria that are flowing through your bloodstream the moment the dentist puts forceps on that tooth. IV vitamin C is something that's not done by every dentist. So you're going to have to do some homework, do some searching around, and find a dentist that does use IV vitamin C when extracting a root canal. And make sure that the tooth is removed thoroughly, that the ligament is removed, any affected bone is removed that might have some gutta percha, some root canal filling material in it, make sure that that is all removed thoroughly with IV vitamin C on board. After the tooth is extracted, you're going to have to make sure that you actually bleed. Oh my gosh, that sounds horrible. Most people don't want to bleed after an extraction. Most people want the bleeding to stop as quickly as possible. Not true in this case. In this case, you do want to bleed a little bit because the bleeding actually washes out the socket, washes out a lot of the bacteria that are just outside the root canal tooth. So bleeding is actually essential part of your healing after the tooth is extracted. You want to make sure that you do bleed. So while we're on the subject of bleeding, it's also very important that the dentist not give you any anesthetic with epinephrine in it. What is epinephrine anyway? Epinephrine is a chemical that is produced by our own bodies, but it's also synthetically produced and placed inside the glass carpule, what holds the anesthetic. And it's placed in there because dentists like to get vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction is where your blood vessels contract and get smaller. When that happens, the patient stays numb for a much longer period of time. It makes it very easy for the dentist to work we don't have to stop and constantly check to see if the patient needs more anesthetic to make sure that they're comfortable. Pretty much going to stay numb for about two hours whenever there's epinephrine added. Epinephrine causes the blood vessels to contract. Remember that. It causes all of the blood vessels to contract. As a matter of fact, some of my patients say that whenever they've had anesthetic or in another dental office with epinephrine, they would have their heart 
banging away. And that's one of the things that it does. It causes all of your blood vessels to contract. The heart immediately knows that it got more difficult to push blood throughout your blood vessels. And so it starts banging away harder and faster, and you feel the difference. Epinephrine also causes the very little capil capillaries, the smallest of the blood vessels, capillaries to close. They close completely. Well, if the capillaries close completely, you're not going to get any blood flow through there. And that's not a good thing. You're not going to be able to wash away the bacteria. So we don't want to have any anesthetic with epinephrine. No epinephrine. Let the blood vessels open up. Let the blood vessels flow. Let the socket be cleaned out thoroughly. And then you will form a good blood clot. You will start to clot when the body knows that all of the bacteria are out of there. You will form a clot, and then that clot is what will turn into your bone. In fact, the best thing in the whole world to make your bone is your own blood. Not artificial bone, not cadaver bone, not hydroxyapatite crystals, nothing except your blood is the best thing in the whole world to make your bone.